Good morning, Idaho. Very early morning to you in Idaho. Good afternoon, Moscow, London, and Cairo. And I am in Beirut, Rahida Dirham, joining you for the 11th e-policy circle, uh, which is a, a run-up to Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi, hopefully in March, which was supposed to be held, of course, in June. Uh, uh, you know uh, that uh, a couple of you have been to the summit, and we look forward to having you with us uh, for the fourth edition of Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi. Let me welcome uh, His Excellency Mr. Minister Mohammed Dairi, former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Libya. He is currently the diplomatic advisor for the Swiss NGO AE Center. His Excellency Ambassador Ryan Crocker, hello from Idaho. Yeah, he has served as US Ambassador to Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs and member of the International Broadcasting Advisory Board. He's currently a diplomat in residence at Princeton University. Both uh, uh, Mohammed Dairi was with us every year at the uh, Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi, and Ambassador Crocker was supposed to join us this year, and hopefully he will uh, uh, in uh, 2021. Lady Olga Maitland is founder at the, of the Defense and Security Forum and chairman of Algerian British Business Council. She's a former member of Parliament for Sutton and Chiam. I think I said that right. Thank you for joining us. And Dr. Irina Zivia Gilskaya. I'm proud of the pronunciation. She's also been with us in Abu Dhabi. Welcome. She's head of the Center of the Middle East Studies at the Primakov National Research Institute of World Economy and International Relations. She is also a professor at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations under the Russian Foreign Ministry. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. As usual, what we will do is that famous four minutes max to each of you to uh, tell us what you want us to learn from you. I'll start with uh, Mohammed Dairi. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rahida. You have requested that we focus on the theme stability redefined. From this vantage point, allow me to shed light uh, on my war-torn country. In this connection, a fundamental question arises. Has there been any attempt to seek and endeavor to reinstate stability out there? It must be noted in this connection that in the last few years, the UN has sought to promote a political settlement against the rather chaotic situation prevailing in my own country. However, the UN diplomatic action has encountered numerous challenges resulting from differences between Libyans. But what has had it, but uh, indeed <clears throat> insult at, was added to injury. When the UN has to see uh, in the last couple of years its search for solutions, its search for uh, political solutions in Libya, compounded and even supplanted by competing initiatives in Europe. In other words, if France convened a high-level meeting in May 2018, it was rival Italy which did everything to calling a similar meeting a few months later, precisely in November 2018. Although the two European nations agreed to settle their own differences in 2019 and thereby allowing Germany to take the lead on the international community efforts to stabilize Libya, the three EU nations saw in the end of the last year the emergence of two dominant players in the military and political areas in Libya, namely Russia and Turkey. The Libyan National Army in the East indeed brought along the Wagner Group to fight with it in and around Tripoli, driving the international recognized government in Tripoli to seek thereafter uh, Turkey military intervention last November. Irrespective of the Berlin conference convened last January by the German Chancellor, Mrs. Merkel, it goes without saying that the private Russian group Wagner, and more importantly, Turkey, are presently 
calling the shots, so to speak, in Libya. Despite repeated calls in the last couple of weeks from the US, the US National Security Council, the EU, and Russia for an immediate ceasefire in Libya, Turkish officials hide nevertheless behind the bush and allegedly claim that the government in Tripoli would still like to see the LNA in the east which is drawing from the central region of the country from precisely from Sirte and Jufra. This said, Egypt has sought through the Cairo declaration early June to push for a diplomatic solution. I would like to note with interest as we have Lady, uh, um, from, uh, Lady Midland from England, who is the uh, lead on the uh, the Joint Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Algerian and UK Chamber of Commerce. I would like to note here with interest that Egypt and Algeria, whose approach to Libya had witnessed some differences in the past, are growingly on the same wavelength. Last but not least, it's still feared as we speak that a military standoff between Turkey and Egypt might surface in the upcoming days and weeks in Libya for the reason I have pointed out to earlier. It should be recalled that mindful of the threats to Egypt national security and regional ones, the Egyptian president Sisi at the end of June said that Sirte and Jufra have been red lines not to be crossed by Turkey and Libya. Therefore, Libya continues to be alas far from stability. Back to you, Ragida. Thank you. Thank you very much for being right on time, uh, Mohammed Dairi. I, I want to engage uh, everyone on the issue of Libya, especially, of course, we have Russia very much involved in Libya. And uh, I think what I'll do is that I will leave it till later, till after I take uh, everybody's uh, uh, four minutes first, and then we can spend a little more time on Libya. I do have several follow-ups for you. But now I'll go to Ryan Crocker, please, to you. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll start with two broad points, if I might. Um, first, in the region, in the broader Middle East, a, someone in the former U.S. administration made a point a while ago to say how difficult all this is. We, the United States has tried regime change and occupation uh, in the case of Iraq. It has tried neither regime change nor occupation in the case of Syria. And to bring it back to Libya, it has tried regime change without occupation. Three models, none of them have worked. Uh, and it illustrates, I think, how very complex and difficult all this is. So two additional points. Uh, first, again, in the region, if you look at the sweep of modern Middle Eastern history since World War I, up to the present, and you look for a single organizing theme to describe that region, it would be the failure of governance. Whether externally imposed governance, case of the mandates after uh, World War I, um, uh, and indigenous efforts uh, to, to form, particularly after the 1950s, uh, countries seeking their own way to govern. Neither model has worked. Uh, so long-term stability, good luck. Uh, final point would be on the United States itself. Uh, World War I and the, Vienna, uh, the uh, Paris Conference basically produced the map of the modern Middle East with all of its woes and problems. What also happened after World War I is that the United States left the scene that it had briefly entered during the war. We pulled back into isolationism. After World War II, a very different story. Uh, the, uh, the post-war peace was designed by the United States, United Nations, uh, Bretton Woods for the international financial order, NATO, and so forth. Uh, we were engaged internationally. We were engaged in the Middle East. Not always perfectly, to say the very least, but we were there. We are now entering the post-United States world and the post-United States Middle East. 
it seems to me we are returning to a balance of power or more often an imbalance of power. The balance of power system brought us two world wars. So with that uh, happy prognosis, I would uh, turn it back to you, Raghada. My dear, I'm very happy indeed. Uh, I have, uh, again, several follow-ups with you on this very uh, depressing prognosis, actually. But I'll go first to uh, Lady Olga Metlin. Thank you very much for being also on time, Ryan Crocker. Please, uh, Olga Metlin. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I really appreciate the honor of being with such distinguished uh, fellow panelists. I'd like to really just preface my remarks about Libya because of my involvement with Algeria. I totally agree that Algeria and Egypt have not always had the easiest of relationships. Um, it has to be said that Algeria has always thought itself as a kind of independent, friendly nation. Um, they've never had any territorial ambitions or indeed engagement, but I think they've always maintained a long-term distant friendship. And I think on that basis, their friendship with Libya is trusted. And I think trust is obviously going to be very key. So I very much hope that we will see some nice surprises later in the year. You never quite know. From my point of view, sitting here in the United Kingdom, the elephant in the room undoubtedly is the issue on China. And if we're talking about stability redefined, um, the newspapers here are full of the decision that Boris Johnson, our prime minister, has had to cancel after all a contractual agreement that the UK had with Huawei, the telecoms company, uh, to put up masts for our 5G. Now, this came about very largely from uh, pressure from Washington, and indeed President Trump had a very wild phone call. In fact, I'm told he was apoplectic when he spoke to Boris Johnson and he discovered that Boris still wanted to maintain an independent line about this. In the end, after many kind of assessments and perhaps post the Hong Kong difficulties, Britain has now rode in with the American wishes. I'm not quite sure this is really the best solution for all of us. I think that we are into a very new world. I think one of the problems all of us face, how do we deal with China? China has a totally different culture, totally different political history, and a totally different assessment on the world. And more than that, they are now becoming more confident. They were economically becoming very strong until COVID hit them, and now that's weakened them no end. But nonetheless, they see themselves as having a rightful place in the world superpower um, platform. Hence, of course, the conflict of interest between China and America. Now, the problem is this. From ourselves in Europe, and you in the Middle East, where do we stand in a rock and a hard place? And my feeling is, is that we've got to redefine how we handle the superpowers. How do we handle our relationships with China in the future? My instinct is that we should row back from um, noisy diplomacy, megaphone diplomacy. It does no good to anybody. I think that we should show um, have a conversational dialogue with China, but be steely in our resolve, which you can only be effective in that resolve on your common basis if your other allies around the world, outside America, join in with this. Now, if you bear in mind countries from Japan to Australia, to the Middle East, to Singapore, to Vietnam, everywhere actually has a common interest, but we haven't really been coordinated. We haven't really got our act together. My feeling is that we actually have no choice because we need a constructive engagement with China. We need to be aware of the difficulties. We need to be aware of the backlashes and we need to be firm about what we believe and stand with. But also we should be clear that we have a mutual interest for all our benefits to engage with China, but perhaps with much clearer ground rules. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I can't resist but do a follow-up with you because last week we had as our guest, one of our guests, Sir John Sawyers, former head of MI6, who uh, is a distinguished uh, a diplomat as well, has been served at the United Nations. 
he, uh, you know, he of course agrees with you that one has to try one's best to work it out with China, but he was very tough in his criticism where I see that you're not accusing them of really like uh, accusing the Chinese of stealing secrets, of not telling the truth, of uh, uh, defying their commitments, not living up to their commitments. And he actually, ex he, he uh, uh, predicted that the 5G collaboration will be ended uh, in light of this, uh, uh, from what he thought was provocation by China. You seem to disagree head on? I do disagree with Sir John Sawyer's assessment about where China is going in all its transgressions, the list is endless. But if you start splitting hairs between every country in the world and how they behave, whether you're going for Russia historically in the past, or whether you go to African continents, wherever you go in the world, you're going to find societies and um, political landscapes which are totally against what we believe and stand for. That's not the issue that I have with Sir John Sawyer. My feeling is, and I think he's missed a trick, is that you should recognize what you're dealing with and work hard to work around it. You don't have to submit yourself to them. You should just be aware. Yeah, well, I think, I think he would differ with you and, 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 and uh, just like, I, I think he knows who, who we're dealing with. After all, he was the head of MI6, so he does know. I wouldn't underestimate him. And I think there is a completely different point of view um, between you and here. And, and uh, uh, I probably think uh, maybe amongst many Americans, we will get back to that in the further discussion. But I'll go to Irina first. Please, Irina, five, uh, four minutes to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I really wanted to start with some general tendencies we are faced with in the Middle East, but since uh, the first talk was on Libya and Russia was mentioned, I believe I have to say something. Because, uh, you know, I believe that Russian role in Libya is very much over-exaggerated. And I can explain why. Because people are mentioning Wagner Group. Wagner Group is a private mercenaries. They are outlawed in Russia. And uh, Russia recognized the government in Tripoli, as you know, pretty well. Russia had some sympathies for, for Haftar, it's true, but first and foremost, it was Haftar himself who wanted to demonstrate that Russia is behind him, which was not exactly true, I would say. And if we come to the real interests of Russia in Libya, I believe Russia really needs stability because we have businessmen who are eager to come back to Libya to compensate for the losses they had just uh, during the civil war, right after the beginning of the civil war. Is it possible right now? No. Only when Libya is stabilized, only when they come back legally, not being afraid of sanctions, we can say it is possible. And you know that Russia really tried to, to contribute to the peace process and uh, doing it collectively with the European states, as you know. Uh, we all remember the conference in Berlin, we all remember the conference in Moscow. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they were not successful, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try again, because Libya is a dangerous place. There are so many players right now, regardless even of the bad impact of COVID-19, which it had upon uh, economic and social life of different countries. And still we, have, we see very active policy of Turkey there and of some other countries, of Egypt, as it was rightly mentioned. And uh, it means that, uh, well, there are probably, again, certain uh, opportunities to try again and to try to find the common ground with the uh, forces on the ground who are really fighting for the leadership, for the territory, and so on and so forth, but which uh, do not think about the danger this conflict presents to the international community. So, but we must think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Okay, this of course puts us right smack into having to, to discuss Libya first. Uh, then we can move to other things. On Libya, Irina, let me stay with you on this. I'm sensing that uh, there's a softer language by Russia now after the Astana summit, uh, of course, virtual summit between Presidents Putin, uh, uh, Erdogan, and Rouhani. 
whereas before that, there was very harsh confrontational language, basically amounting that Russia wanted to revenge from Turkey in Libya after having uh, sort of uh, tasted sour treatment in Idlib. Uh, you are thinking uh, now it's not the case anymore? Something, did something happen to change that course? Is there a deal in the making between Turkey and Russia over Libya? What I can say that the Libya issue has been discussed not once, as you know, between Russia and Turkey. And it means that, uh, thanks God, uh, Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Putin still can find common language on certain different, di very difficult issues, like Idlib, as you rightly mentioned, and Libya po probably as well. So uh, I believe that uh, it's high time to, 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 to look for some much more moderate and practical cause in Libya. And what did you mean, Irina, by saying that Haftar himself wanted to demonstrate that Russia was behind him? I thought that Russia was actually behind Haftar. That there not was to actually the degree he wanted it. Not to the degree he wanted it, because as far as I know, he really what he really wanted, he wanted to have photos of him being in Russia, being greeted by Russian officials, probably even president. With what never happened, and this never happened, as you know. But still, you know, there was a sort of, um, well, I would say propaganda, which he started just demonstrating that he's strong enough and he has rather Russia behind. And it means something. He is a good, he is a strong player. Yeah. But as I said, there, there were sympathies because he was fighting ISIS. Right, but he is now, he is dispensable, I hear you say, if there is a ceasefire. Haftar is dispensable. If is there is a ceasefire and if there is a certain agreement on, on the future of, of uh, Libya, I believe that, of course, he is indispensable. He yes. is a very strong actor, whether we like it or not. He is dispensable or indispensable? What are you saying? Depends on how you look at it. <laughs> oh, uh, listen to what Irina uh, Ziagelskaya is saying. That's very it's interesting news, it must be, to you. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I would like to uh, point out that uh, when it comes to Turkey and Russia, uh, they have indeed uh, some coordination, uh, both in Syria and Libya. But let's, let me stress here that the upper hand in Libya is with Turkey right now. It's not with Russia at all. And Mr. Putin twice brushed aside any notion of uh, ties, strong ties to uh, a Wagner group, to, to the government. He did that in January when uh, uh, he received Mrs. Merkel and uh, held a joint press conference on the 11th of January when they had both uh, launched the, the, the truce. And recently, uh, President Macron of France has stated that when he talked a couple of weeks ago to Mr. Putin, Mr. Putin once again uh, denied any strong ties, any notion of links between the Russian government and, uh, and, uh, 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 and Wagner. Let me say that in, in Syria, it's the other way around. We have a, a government, uh, a, an official army, the Syrian army, which is present and heavily present in Syria. In Libya, as uh, Irina has pointed out, the Russians uh, have sought to play it safe and to have uh, both links with both parties. Uh, recently, indeed, the Russian government received a delegation from the internationally recognized government in, in Tripoli. But on, on Mr. Haftar, let me say that he didn't uh, pose, uh, he didn't want to push himself on the Russians. The Russians received him twice in 2016 when he started to uh, forge ties to them on one hand. On the other, I think um, uh, openly, and uh, it, 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 it went, I think, uh, with a great deal of notice, uh, is that he uh, uh, rebuffed the Russian uh, proposal last January, on the 13th of January, when he met with the, the Russian officials, and he didn't want to uh, sign the agreement that had been uh, signed already in the, in, on that day between uh, uh, the Russians and the Turks on one hand and between the Russian and the government in Tripoli. So I, I, I think since then, indeed, Russia 
has distanced itself from him, and they have embraced Mr. Aguila Saleh, the HOR, the House of Representatives speaker, who uh, openly uh, acknowledged that he was approached by Russian officials in uh, last April, and he launched uh, his so-called initiative on the need to uh, bring about a political settlement uh, in Libya. Uh, I, I must say that um, Mr. Hafter, in so doing, he has also uh, uh, distanced himself not only from Russia, but also from other allies such as Egypt and uh, the Emirates and, we, uh, and France. And we have seen indeed recently uh, some vocal uh, messages coming uh, from the Emirates, from Egypt, about their uh, reservation as to uh, Mr. Haftar policies on one hand. And recently, Mr. Macron, when he met with uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel, he pointed out that uh, he was in total disagreement with Mr. Haftar's decision to uh, launch an offensive on Tripoli last year, on one hand. On the other, he also stated that uh, uh, he, he was not in favor of Mr. Haftar, but like the Russians, he was in favor of uh, pushing for a political settlement between the two. And uh, indeed, he pointed to meetings that he hosted in France. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I need to ask you quickly, quickly to explain yourself when you speak mm -hmm. about the Turkey-Egypt standoff. Do you think there will be one? Is this what, uh, you know, is, is it tur turning now into a Turkey-Egypt potential standoff instead of, of, of a Russian-Turkish uh, potential standoff? Quickly, please, do not elaborate for too long. I need to bring in others. No, uh, in, two, in, in, two, in a couple of words, I, I fear indeed that a military standoff uh, might come through. Uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of uh, Turkey uh, uh, on Monday to the Financial Times said that the government in Tripoli, as I said, they, they hide uh, behind the government in Tripoli, but uh, we all know that the, Turkish, the Turks now are really uh, having the upper hand in Tripoli, both militarily and politically. So. Uh, they would like to push uh, for an offensive against Sirte and Jufra. I fear that, and uh, in the upcoming, may, maybe tomorrow or the day after, or in the upcoming weeks, the tension is very high between the, the two sides. Uh, Ryan Crocker, do you think it's going to, uh, you know, really end up in a standoff, an actual standoff between Turkey and Egypt, or do you think both hands are, t both parties have their hands tied up because neither one? Well, I don't know if. Really, Egypt wants to engage in a war with Turkey for Libya, nor do I think that Turkey has the potential for sustainability of its military operations in uh, uh, Libya. What do you think? And the U.S. has been, uh, like Brett McGurk called it last week, uh, what is it, active, what? I'm going to remember the word for you, but that basically that the U.S. wants to do nothing about it. Ryan Crocker, please. Well, thanks. Uh, we're getting better and better at doing nothing uh, <laughs> as you uh, look at the way forward. I, I, would, I would say just a couple of points here on Libya and how it speaks for, if you will, the entire region. Uh, uh, first of all, we're seeing the recurrence of the pattern of uh, fusion between local actors, regional actors, and international actors that has characterized the Middle East again since, uh, since World War I. Uh, a, a second point would be the role of ideology. Uh, as uh, President Erdogan takes Turkey closer and closer to a Muslim brother ascendancy, um, latest step, of course, being the, if you will, the Islamization of uh, the Santa Sophia Mosque, uh, this is a huge factor, and it is, it is why we see uh, Turkey pitted against Egypt and against Saudi Arabia. Um, there is only room for one brand of political Islam, Salafi or Ikhwan, uh, as they see it. And we, we cannot uh, uh, discount that factor um, at all. So I, I would predict more instability. Uh, uh, I, I think you're right, Raga, that uh, none of the external players want total war. Uh, uh, they can remind themselves that war is expensive. Uh, uh, just ask us. And the, uh, I would think the then Soviet experience in Afghanistan uh, would, would inform beyond the rhetoric 
uh, where where Russia, how far Russia is prepared to go and at what cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't look for a regional hegemon. Don't look for the United States to come back and try to run the region. Uh, I, I think what we're the the present is the future. I, I think a sustained pattern, if you will, of um, of fragmentation, regional and international involvement in the affairs of the Middle East. Uh, and I, I certainly do not see a bright light out there um, in this particular dawn. Yeah. Ryan Crocker, uh, again, back to the exact word that Brett McGurk, uh, who is, of course, uh, very, you know, he probably is a friend of yours, is an excellent diplomat. He called it, referred to the U uh, American role in Turkey as active neutrality, his words. I thought that was a very interesting uh, uh, description of, 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 of the role in, uh, of the U.S. in Libya. Is it uh, somewhere else like that, Ryan Crocker, or is that confined to Libya? Um, well, Brett is a great American diplomat, and I, I think history will demonstrate just how great. Um, I, I would give you another two-word formula. Um, belligerent minimalism. <laughs> to to characterize, I think, the foreign policy of uh, the current administration. And uh, Lady Olga, you, you spoke to this. Uh, I never thought anyone be able, would be able to um, uh, outshout Prime Minister Johnson. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, President Trump seems to, have, seems to have done that. That's the belligerency. The, the minimalism uh, is that the president has been very reluctant to engage and certainly reluctant to engage with U.S. military force uh, throughout the region. So you've got the, again, belligerency on one hand, minimalism on the other. Um, and uh, I think the region is going to continue to be in a, in a state and, of turmoil. And, and would, would that change, Ryan Crocker, if uh, Joe Biden becomes president, given that, of course, he is also, he was the vice president of President Barack Obama, when they both were very tolerant of uh, Turkey and its uh, adoption of, you know, the so-called, uh, you know, moderate Islam, later demonstrated in not moderate Islam at the hands of the Muslim Brotherhood. Do you think we're going to have a return of the embrace of uh, mo the Muslim Brotherhood by Joe Biden if he becomes president, as he did when he was vice president? I, I, um, I, I think I would characterize it slightly differently. As we look at the, the U.S. and the Middle East, it's not a choice for us of, um, you know, democracy versus autocracy. Uh, uh, there isn't much democracy out there on the ground. Uh, it's the choice between order and disorder. Uh, and, and Turkey, even under the rule of uh, President Erdogan, uh, broadly speaking, has been a force for order. Early member of NATO, um, uh, as everyone on this panel certainly knows, of course, the contention uh, during the Soviet era and under the Russian Empire over influence, if not outright control of Turkey. Uh, so there, there are a number of factors in play here. What I do think you'll see with uh, a President Biden uh, is a, uh, a selective return to a policy of um, internationalism in America. All his years as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it's been about engagement, engagement, engagement. And if he is uh, elected president, I, I think that's the direction he would take. Not only will it be diametrically opposed to what um, uh, President Trump is doing in terms of neo-isolationism, it will differ from the Obama approach. It will be, I think, and he's already signaled this, uh, more active, uh, a more active role, not just in the Middle East, but uh, internationally. How far can he take it? What control can he bring? Uh, that we'll have to wait and see, but it will be a for a pillar of the establishment, as Joe Biden is, I, I think you're going to see with him perhaps something almost revolutionary. What, wait, wait, why? Why revolutionary? You got, I was about to, I was about to leave you, but tell me now, why would I see something from him almost revolutionary? You're talking about Joe Biden if, as president. Why would that be? How? Uh, well, because, of course, uh, as we see with President Trump and 
uh, Joe Biden's reaction to that, he, he is an internationalist. Uh, he believes that long-term prosperity, security, and stability uh, come through an American role globally. Uh, uh -huh. Very different from President Trump, but also different from President Obama. Uh, uh, so what's revolutionary about this? It's a third way, if you will, uh, uh, to, to, to be revolutionary by going back to the past when, uh, let's say, the world seemed to be doing a little better uh, under uh, U.S. leadership than it had under a balance of power system. Uh, Olga Maitland and then Irina as, as Zia, Zia Verskaya. Uh, I want to uh, also hear from both of you on the potential of what would the presidency of Joe Biden mean to Europe by, on first, and then I'm going to speak uh, Russia second. Uh, would you, uh, Lady Olga, would you agree with uh, what uh, Ryan Crocker just said? Uh, well, that there's one point I want to try. There's one point I'd like to take uh, issue with all of you is the assumption that there's going to be kind of a rise in military engagements around the world. Don't forget the world is going through an economic crisis. Um, and it's been spurred by COVID, it's been spurred by a lot of different issues. So therefore the appetite to actually fund military activity is much reduced. And that would apply even to Egypt. Um, if they can get a settlement without any military action, they would, and the same for Turkey, none of them could afford it. There is, this is going to be a cold bath. Yeah. And I think in a sense, going back to the Libyan engagement, I think at the end of the day, economics will probably bring people more rapidly to the table than military threats. As regards um, a potential presidency from uh, Mr. Biden, he doesn't hold any fears for me because I have a feeling he's going to be much more low key, he'll be calmer, there'll be less kind of Trump-esque wild statements and sanctions without much thought. If he's going to engage in the world, he will do it, perhaps, but probably he'll be much more restrained than because history will bear heavily on his shoulders. America will not have any appetite for military engagement. Thank you. Irina, Irina Zviagiskaya, uh, would you welcome, would Russia welcome uh, a second term for President Donald Trump or would it prefer a new term, or new, a new president, uh, Joe Biden? Well, actually, it's not our choice. It would be choice of America. Would you like it to be your choice? And if it, if it, I want to say just a moment because I, I do not have any any personal likings either for, for Trump or for Mr. Biden. What I want to say that there is a general trend uh, and this general trend is that the Middle East is no longer a priority for the United States. So no matter who will come, whether Trump will stay or Mr. Biden, will be a new American president, uh, the, this situation will not be changed. So what can be changed? Style, political affiliations, uh, the need to take part in certain uh, international efforts to, to, to settle the, the, the problems, to, to be more predictable, and so on and so forth. Uh, from my point of view, it will mostly be attributed rather to style than to strategy. I don't see a real change of strategy the moment Mr. Biden, if, uh, becomes the president. I don't think so. You mean in Syria? You mean in uh, Iraq? You mean in there is a, a lack of interest in the Hello. United States for the Middle East. Okay. Stay with me, Irina, and I want to bring in Ryan Crocker on this because I think there is a lot of interest in the Taliban story and its consequences on American-Russian relations uh, and, 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 and probably on the U.S. election, presidential elections. Can, can you tell me if you think it will impact the elections? Uh, what are you doing about it? Because it's a serious story. It's probably right now not hot the front page, because there's another front page story, but it's a serious story in the U.S. Irina, go first, and then I want to try it proper. No, it's a fake story. Absolutely, 100%. It's a fake story that Russia and Taliban to kill Americans. It's an invention of some crazy journalist. Uh, 
If they're taking advantage of it during the elections, I feel sorry for the Americans. You know? Ryan? I would largely agree with that. I, frankly, I don't think the um, Taliban need to be paid to kill Americans. Um, <laughs> it seems to be a core element of their agenda in any case. The real story in Afghanistan, I think, is not that. Uh, it has been the further indication of um, a Trumpian isolationism, if you will. The, the negotiations that the U.S. has held with the Taliban without the presence of the Afghan government uh, very clearly signals to me is, and, and to all Afghans, we're going home. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if we can get a deal with the Taliban that is going to return some semblance of stability to Afghanistan, that's great, but it doesn't really matter. We're going home. Uh, and uh, it's kind of stunning to me, given that 9-11 came to us out of a Taliban-ruled uh, Afghanistan, That's and right. that rather than give up their Al-Qaeda ally, the Taliban chose to spend now two decades in the wilderness, tells me very clearly that those bonds uh, have remained. They are strong. They will be far stronger if the Taliban take over in Afghanistan. So what, what I see in Trump's policies here is first to betrayal, frankly, of American values as we tell Afghans, and particularly Afghan women, uh, you step forward, we've got your back. Well, we're saying now, not so much, you know, good luck, goodbye, we're finished, but also for American national security. Um, Let me, I, I need to have all of your inputs uh, and on this story that is getting attention. Uh, it's a New York Times story, actually, about the Iran-China partnership. Uh, I want uh, to, uh, to give it a good discussion amongst you, which is the, about the investment and security pact between the two of, uh, countries that will vastly extend China's influence in the Middle East, throwing Iran an economic lifeline and creating new flashpoints with the United States. It's basically a conference, you know, it, it, it's undercutting the Trump administration's uh, efforts to isolate Iran, and Iran has gotten, like it said in the story, a lifeline. Uh, why don't I, since, since I've not spoken to the minister for, for a while, why don't I start with uh, uh, Mohammed Dairi to tell me how would that impact the region if Iran gets that lifeline and, uh, uh, from China and what, what impact would it have on the region from your point of view? And then I'm going to ask you all to think about that and tell me what you uh, want me to hear from you. Go ahead. I, I, yes, thank you. I, I think it uh, comes as no surprise that Iran uh, and China have pursued this uh, kind of close coordination. Uh, the story, uh, I think uh, we can give a, a great deal of uh, credibility to it. Uh, it in tandem with the China policies in Syria. And we have noted that in the last uh, couple of days, uh, China and uh, Russia both uh, vetoed a uh, UN resolution on Syria. So I think the, uh, the, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, China would uh, uh, seek to uh, forge better relationship uh, with, uh, with Iran. Uh, while speaking of Iran, I, I would like just to point out that uh, um, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had also on Libya, um, uh, the statement of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iran, who condoned the uh, uh, Turkish support to the government in Tripoli. So we have uh, some sort of coordination uh, between the two countries in Libya. Uh, one has also to mention that last year, uh, I think uh, Western intelligence came to know uh, that uh, a boat loaded with the weaponry uh, landed in Misrata to the benefit of the government in Tripoli. So there is that connection uh, between, uh, uh, rising connection between Turkey and Iran in Libya. But uh, when it comes to, chi to China and Iran, I think uh, it's uh, part of uh, this uh, increased engagement by China in the, in the Middle East. Uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, it's a shared uh, uh, policy that uh, China pursues both in Syria and uh, in Iran. Interesting. I did not know that Iran was very active in Libya, Mohammed Dairi. This is recent or it's been brewing for a while? No, last year, there, as I said, there was that boat, which uh, I think even uh, uh, Western intelligence came to know, and they drew the attention of the government in Tripoli in, 
uh, on the need to distance themselves from uh, Iran. But recently, uh, we have uh, some close ties uh, between Turkey and Iran, not only in, uh, in Libya, but also in, uh, there are talks about some sort of support that Turkey may provide to uh, Iran in Yemen too. So I think there is that uh, increased coordination between the two countries when it comes to uh, regional issues in Libya, in Yemen, uh, in Lebanon, etc. cetera. Uh, thank you, Mohamed Dairi. Irina Zivia Gelskaya, does the China rise in the Middle East undermine Russia's plans? Uh, does it uh, sort of pull the, uh, I mean, that's packed with uh, Iran. Does that, is it something that is part of that relationship between China and uh, Russia? I know that they couple up a lot in the use of veto in the Security Councils, particularly on the issue of um, Syria. But I, how much is this uh, welcomed by Russia uh, well, or looked at with dismay? Excuse me. Uh, first of all, I believe that it's a good lesson for those who probably think that there are countries which can be isolated completely. So there was a real pressure on Iran, as we very well know, there, there are sanctions and they are getting from bad to worse. And Iran was looking forward to get some ally, to get certain support from the countries which do not support the idea of uh, Iran, keeping Iran uh, isolated in the region. So China is a good partner from this point of view. It can really provide Iran with all uh, it needs nowadays. Never the other I mean, excuse me to just uh, uh, bring in an interesting point here, because both uh, in that case, as you well know, in case of Russia in uh, Syria, there is the Caesars Act where Russian companies can be exposed to sanctions by the uh, Caesars Act that is now uh, a court order, it's like law in the US. You, don't, you think China will not be exposed to this sort of sanctions if it goes ahead and defies the US sanctions against Iran and exports oil? And, or, you don't, or you think if you join efforts together, you could stand up together to the United States? I believe that China can really outlive any sanctions nowadays. It can easily survive. If it doesn't need Russia, even it can it can do it alone, and this is very important because, as far as I understand, there is a nightmare in Washington that China and Russia unite against the United States. I believe it's not true because while well, we we do we are allies, but at the same time our interests are different, and it, it's it's obvious to everyone. So when we are talking about China, let's talk about China, not plus Russia, because these are different subjects. Interesting. So uh, one, should, one should dismiss this talk about a China, Russia, Iran access. <laughs> this is too much. This is too much. Okay, so the answer is, you know, it's ridiculous that the way you're laughing at it, right? No. Is this Yes. So, you know, there are so many exes now in the Middle East. Some of them are real, some of them are phantom. But okay. this is a sort of, you know, phantom. Phantom, okay. Um, and they, uh, uh, Ryan Crocker, I'm going to come to you uh, after I hear it from uh, uh, Lady Olga. Please, uh, can you go ahead and tell me why, you know, if you think it's fine, Europe, especially the UK, and you personally welcome at, uh, this uh, pact between China and Iran? Uh, given that, you know, you have uh, policies that are uh, rather uh, critical of the Iranian behavior. So tell me now, are you still soft on China? <laughs> Not so much of being soft on China, it's accepting a reality. Accepting and what reality, what, uh, Lady Olga? What do you mean accepting a reality? What, what does that mean? We can say that about anything in the world, accept a reality. I mean, that China is a great country, we know that, and that it's a superpower, yes. What reality are you calling on us to accept? The reality is that um, China is now a major economic superpower. Now, yeah, until... Yeah, the wait, 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 let me complete my sentence. Please. Until the last year or two, China was operating kind of 
almost stealthily using economic kind of uh, inducements. Now they become much more aggressive. But what does seem to have happened to my mind, which is very clear, the templates of power has shifted. And very clearly, America has one position and they are uh, feeling very uncomfortable with a much more assertive China, which is actually going to end up being much richer than America, although America still has supremacy. We are seeing a big shift in templates. With it, you see that China has the economic strength to give support to its friends in the region. Yeah. Therefore, I'm not remotely surprised. Yeah, you, Sandy, Fred, please address the, 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 the issue of a pact, a 25-year-old pact with military uh, uh, intelligence cooperation, with exchange of, uh, uh, you know, not only economic, but also China and Iran pact. That is reported and that has been confirmed that it's a new development. And can you address that particular uh, matter, whether you think... Uh, I'm not you remotely surprised. Wait a minute. I'm not remotely surprised they've entered in this pact because in effect, What's happened is the impact of sanctions and isolation has pushed Iran to find other sources of support. So right. to a certain extent, we have to understand that. Now, of course, they're going to go where they get money and where they get influence and where they will get support. It's a natural force of life. So to my mind, don't be surprised about it. No. So, okay, one last time with you, Lady, lady uh, Olga Matlin. Do you sanction that? Do you approve that? Do you think it is a good thing that there is a pact between China and Iran? It, it, does the UK, would the UK welcome that? I think we miss an opportunities, and indeed America, in forging a very different relationship with Iran. And the more you push a country away, the more you push them into other arms. Yes. So we have made mistakes. So I, it's not so much whether I approve or disapprove, it's just matter, it's a reality. And to a certain extent, the Western nations have a role in making that happen. All right. Uh, Ryan Crocker, I'm running out of time. I'm going to give you plenty of time to address this issue and its implications and long term and short term. Uh, because this is a long term pact. I mean, it is not only, a, unless you think otherwise, Ryan Crocker, and also please combine that with what uh, the, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has been saying about China, uh, uh, China's actions in the China Sea. There's been an escalation in language there. So would you think there is any possibility that there would be a military confrontation between the US and China? And address both angles, please, if you don't mind, Ryan Crocker, to you. The, 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 if there is a military clash between the U.S. and China in, uh, in the Pacific, it will be by inadvertence, not by calculation. Uh, there are a lot of warships running around out there under, um, and how much control there is between nations, I, I have no idea. I do uh, very much agree with Dr. Irina earlier that there is no appetite in the United States or indeed globally for uh, huge new major conflicts. Uh, but then again, there was no appetite for major conflict in July of 1914 either. Uh, uh, again, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of countries with a lot of weapons, uh, including nuclear weapons, and no real international order any longer. The world is becoming increasingly dangerous. China and Iran, I do think it's overstated. Uh, uh, Pakistan, where I served as ambassador uh, a decade or so ago, spoke of its celestial relationship with China. Um, well, there was no there there, basically. Uh, the, the Chinese were interested in economic advantage. Uh, they uh, worked to develop the port of Gwadar uh, on, in Balochistan and Pakistan. Uh, and what were they developing it um, with what aim? Um, well, to take trade away from Chabahar. Uh, uh, you're, there's only room for really one major port there, and the Chinese uh, were putting their money literally on Gwadar. So I, I do think this is overstated. Um, uh, I, I think. Explain that, please. Why do you say, why do you think it's overstated? Explain that if you don't mind. Well, I, I say that because I, as I look at it, I don't see much in the way of um, 
concrete action. Now, it is about the economy. I think we could all agree on that, particularly for Iran, and we have to face it. Uh, uh, the Trump administration's sanctions have, have created a real problem for Iran. Their, uh, their economy is in, sh in, in shambles, and yes, uh, China could step in and throw, throw the lifeline out. Uh, if they do, it will have to be very carefully calculated. Uh, you can certainly posit that the U.S. can't win a trade war with China, but the Chinese would have to think very carefully about uh, how far they want to push, particularly this administration. I, I can't make those calculations. I, I would say that um, uh, the Chinese will, or they certainly should. Last point, if you will, because we haven't talked about it. Uh, Lady Olga brought it up, COVID-19. COVID uh, we're we're kind of having a a conversation here as though there were no world war. Well, there is a world war. It is COVID against all the rest of us. And if you look at the figures coming out of my own country, uh, we lost somewhere around 300,000 men in combat in World War II. Um, right now, the number of COVID deaths in the United States is approaching about half that number already. Uh, so the one prediction I could not give you is were you to assemble this um, in <clears throat> July of 2021, I can't begin to predict what we would be talking about. And mainly because I can't begin to predict the devastation that COVID will continue to wreak on all of us. So. I just think that's a very important point to make, and I'm glad we got it out there. And I'm sad that it's the last point that you are making because it's it's um, it, it's it is something that we need to think about. But it's sombering, and um, yes, we need to wake up again uh, rather than assume that things are a little better. Uh, Ryan Crocker, stay with me. Do not leave yet. Thank you very much, everybody. As we get about. 30 seconds now, and go backward. I'll go with uh, uh, Lady Olga Maitland. Uh, 30 seconds to you, please, whatever last thoughts you have. My last abiding thought is that I agree with Ambassador Crocker. The COVID-19 has affected everybody's thinking and capacity for action which they might otherwise have taken. So we're much more limited. Secondly, we must end uh, this megaphone diplomacy. We must now engage much more with people and we must also understand there is a shifting templates. The world has changed. And I hope that in the future, we will have more constructive dialogue and more constructive engagement. It's the only way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Lady Olga uh, Methland. Uh, I'm going to go to Mohammed Dairi. Minister Mohammed Dairi. Thank you. Uh, I would like at first to, uh, I would beg to defer with the concept that uh, Turkey is bringing order. Uh, from where I am sitting in, in this region, I think Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt are increase, increasingly worried about uh, the Turkish influence uh, in Libya. And uh, that's why I said recently we have witnessed a rapprochement between Algeria, uh, Egypt on, on one hand, and even between the, two, uh, the three countries, including t Tunisia. Um, uh, Turkey has brought uh, fighters from Syria, including uh, some who were connected to uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, uh, an, off an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, alongside ISIS fighters. It has been proved on one hand. On the other, uh, recently, uh, in the last few days, uh, Western embassies relocated in Tunis, uh, which are uh, accredited to Libya, are incre increasingly worried about the recent arrival of, Tunisia, of Tunisians from Syria through Turkey in, in Western Libya, and they are posing threats to uh, the, uh, the security of these embassies if they were to move out of Tunis to Tripoli on one hand. And I am given to understand that Tunisian officials are increasingly worried about this arrival. Last but not least, yeah. I would hope that uh, as uh, Ambassador uh, Crocker uh, wished, uh, has wished, I would uh, uh, plead for a further engagement, a, a renewed engagement, uh, maybe a, a further en engagement from the US uh, whether uh, President uh, um, Trump is re-elected or Mr. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Biden is elected to be the forthcoming I, president. I, we need some support I, from the U.S. 
to Germany, which cannot uh, alone uh, 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 play that lead role in Libya. I plead with you, to, and dear, sorry about the interruption, but uh, we have to be right on time. I'm sorry, Irina, 30 seconds to you. It seems that I'm like not right uh, distributing the time. Go ahead, Irina. Well, I just want to say that the Middle East can be a priority and not a priority, but the fact is that we just cannot leave it and just cannot close the door and say, and we don't care much. We do care, we have responsibility, and probably it's a chance to come together again and to think what can be done. Thank you very much, everybody. Minister Mohammed Dairi, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, Lady Olga Medlin, uh, Irina uh, Zivia Gelskaya, thank you very much for joining me. Let me tell you who's going to be with us next week, and I can't tell you the full titles because there'll be no time. And, and this will be the 12th uh, Beirut Issue Summit e Policy Circle, and it will focus on. on relations and sustainability again in Lebanon so if you have lost me don't worry about it I'm still alive I want to thank you for joining me and forgive the that's why we rush at the end thank you all for joining me have a wonderful day goodbye everyone <laughs> thank you bye 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 thank you Oh, my God.